It starts with six shots ringing out in the night. A 14-year-old boy has calmly aimed a handgun at the heads of two people asleep in bed and blasted them at point-blank range. His mother and father. Somehow, John and Beth Brooks survived the attack, but rather than be angry with their son Nathan for trying to kill them, they forgive him. Why is the question police still can't answer? Nine one one. What's the address of the emergency? I do zero South Battery Road. Somebody broke it. We've all been shot. I A man has been shot point blank, but the call for help is calm and controlled. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. I don't know. I woke up and we've all been shot. Who's been shot, sir? My wife and I. Yes, I got blood all over everywhere. I've been shot in the head. John Brooks and his wife Beth had been asleep when suddenly they were woken by someone standing in their upstairs bedroom with a gun. All I really saw was a dark figure um, standing there. And what made this even stranger, that dark figure was their own son. I just remember thinking that it would be much better if they weren't around to, to boss me around to tell me what to do. And I pulled the trigger three times at my mom. Bang, bang, bang. I was shot in the face, so it, um, it just shattered this bone. The bullet went um, in through here very closely, missed the bo bone to the spine. And then I aimed it towards my dad, and I pulled it another three times. I was shot in the forehead. Um, it was kind of a, a glancing blow. Part of the um, fragments actually entered into my brain. Do you know how much blood you were losing? I knew I was hurt bad because I kept losing sight. Um, the blood kept coming, and, and it was getting in my eyes, and I couldn't see, so I had to keep wiping it away. Um, so I knew right away that we were both hurt bad. Um, and at that same time, I had no idea where our children were. After firing the six bullets, I think I was there for not even two seconds. I remember seeing my mom try to get up and my dad roll out of bed, and that's it. It was just, it happened so quickly. Where's the suspect now? I don't know. We're hiding in the room. My daughter's with me. I don't know where my son is. Officer Rick Francis received the call. Shots were fired and the shooter may still be in the house. When you arrived, what sort of scene confronted you? It was creepy. It was, the, the place was dark. Then, bizarrely, John and Beth's son, Nathan, calmly opened the front door, dressed only in his underpants. When he answered the door, he, there was no emotion or anything like that going on with him. You know, he wasn't breathing hard or, or like frantic or, or anything like that. Didn't which, seem stressed or yeah, anxious. Yeah, was, it was strange. As the officers searched the house for clues, they discovered something unusual. Security cameras that were positioned inside the home. And there, recorded on the monitor at the time of the attack, was a near-naked Nathan Brooks walking through the home with a gun in his hand. We watched the video, um, and we could see Nathan <laughs> running around in the house with a gun. Um, so I went back in to John, um, and uh, John said to me, he goes, was it Nathan? And I'm like, I don't know, was it Nathan? He goes, I think it was. But John says that conversation didn't happen. It's one of many times his version of events contradicts the police. Did it ever cross your mind at all that your son could have possibly been the shooter? Um, no, the only thing that I found um, that I guess puzzled me, I didn't understand, is when the um, 
paramedics had taken me down the stairs and I was going through the living room, uh, the uh, police department had Nathan in handcuffs on my way out the door. Within minutes of entering the house, police arrested the suspect, John and Beth's 14-year-old son, who was taken to the station. Tell me what went on down at your folks' house tonight. So I was asleep, and I woke up. There was, I don't know, a few gunshots, and I heard screaming, but it was more like yelling. I could hear my dad yelling. This is Nathan's police statement taken shortly after his arrest. What started as lies quickly unravel when police reveal there's video of him carrying the gun. I'm giving you a chance to be honest with me because you haven't been to this point. I don't even know what I was thinking. And what were you trying to do when you pulled the trigger? What a gun does. Which is? Kill. It was a stunning confession from a callous teenager, and for his crime, he was sentenced to 15 and a half years behind bars. Two hours outside of Portland, I'm heading to the maximum security Green Hill Juvenile Detention Centre, where some of America's most violent young criminals have been imprisoned. I'm here to see Nathan Brooks, who's now aged 18 and is three years into his sentence. What was the trigger for the attack? I think the, the trigger for me for the attack was that that night, my dad had told me after getting a detention at school that I wasn't allowed to participate in the, in the upcoming basketball tournament. You were angry? I was, I was very angry. It turns out Nathan often found himself in trouble with his parents, grounded, he says, on a weekly basis. So on the evening of March 8th, 2013, he decided to do something about it. He waited in his room until his parents fell asleep, then pried open the gun safe, took out a 22 revolver and walked to their room. And I kind of just sat there and, 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 and looked at him and just remember being frustrated that, that these people were taking all my rights from me that I felt that I deserved. Police arrived a few minutes after the shooting. And when Nathan saw the flashing lights, he says he tossed the weapon in the backyard pool and opened the front door. After the last shot and I tried to fire it again and there were no longer any, any bullets left, I, that was when I had this instant, just undescribable amount of remorse. It was a big, oh no, moment. It was huge. It was a, it was a huge, oh no moment. But here's a contradiction. Police say the only time Nathan ever showed any hint of remorse so stupid. was when he was caught lying in his police interview. <laughs> they claim he showed no regard for the health of his parents, even as they spent weeks in hospital recovering from gunshot wounds to the head. From a mother's point of view, how do you react to the fact that your son tried to kill you? Shock, disbelief. Over the last few years, uh, Beth and I have both come back hundreds and hundreds of times to every decision we've ever made. Should have we been nicer? Should have we done this or that or everything? But Officer Rick Francis isn't buying the excuses. He's got his own theories on why it might have happened. Do you think they were trying to hide something? Yeah, definitely. What do you think that might be? Well, I think that uh, there's some people that have secrets. Coming up, what made Nathan snap? What on earth 
could your parents have possibly done that made you want to kill them? Was it mental illness? I have one of the most severe versions of depression. Or something much worse. Somebody always tries to dredge something up that quite it honestly pisses you off and makes you wish you'd never come to sit down with them. That's next on 60 Minutes. This was it. It was locked. I just don't know that it was locked well or good enough, obviously. John and Beth Brooks are hunters. Deer and birds, their usual targets. They kept more than a dozen firearms locked in a safe. Uh, looks like uh, 14. People think we're odd because we hunt. This is... But when you grow up doing that, that is your normal. John and Beth's son, Nathan, seemed like a typical kid. He enjoyed school, sports, and apparently loved his parents and his sister. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> he went to school, goofed around, did schoolwork, very intelligent. We had several teachers tell us that. But somewhere along the way, Nathan started to rebel and became obsessed with violent computer games. Would you ever have violent thoughts? Um, well, I, I think just about everybody has violent thoughts occasionally, but I don't ever really remember having intentional thoughts of harming other people. Curiously, even now, Nathan and his parents are evasive on the question of why he did it, and their stories often differ. But one thing they do agree on is that Nathan suffers from depression, which they didn't know at the time. What on earth could your parents have possibly done that made you want to kill them? And that's, I think, I mean, that's, that's the number one question everywhere you go among people. That's what everyone wants to know. Why? Um, yeah, is that exactly, is, is why. I mean, why would someone do this? I have one of the most severe versions of depression. Um, with a lot of people, depression affects people in different ways. Um, there's your depressed people that sleep, and then there's your depressed people that are very irritable. I just happen to be one of the ones that were very easily irritable. And for me, it was... It, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. It just any little thing frustrated me. Had there been any abuse of any kind that had taken place? No, my, my parents never really, my parents never abused me. I was never hit, I was never, there was never verbal abuse. I mean, every child, you know, don't do that, shame on you, but never was I ever verbally abused or physically abused. So it was just one night that you just snapped? It was just one night and I was, just really vulnerable with everything that was going on, and it was too much for my brain to handle, and I just snapped. But Officer Rick Francis, the first responder to the attack who's investigated the case for years, believes something more sinister is at work. Do you have any doubt that he knew what he was doing? Oh, no. I, I, he, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, when you get up close and personal, when you do a crime like that, um, and you shoot somebody point blank, you put a gun in their face, and then you pull the trigger, um, that's personal. Police say the Brooks family has been investigated before over abuse allegations and were uncooperative. And that investigation was uh, stymied. Um, by, uh, by John and, and his wife. How do you mean? I mean, they just blocked it. No cooperation, no nothing, no access. When I put that allegation to John and Beth, the mood shifted and became tense. In 2010, police investigated a report that your son molested a girl who was younger than he was, but you allegedly prevented police from interviewing your son. So the investigation was dropped. Why did you stop police from talking to your son? Um, 
One, uh, come to find out through the school that um, alleged that, um, come to find out they were wrong in the way they uh, did it. Uh, two, the police talked to the victim and found that there was nothing to charge. So after we were told that there was no, no crime had been committed, they asked to interview him. I said, well, if no crime has been committed, then no, he won't be interviewed. So just for clarification, has any abuse at all taken place under your roof, be it sexual abuse or physical abuse? No, none whatsoever. You know, you get into where you're going good and, and somebody always tries to dredge something up that quite it honestly pisses you off and makes you wish you'd never come to sit down with them. But John and Beth were watching their son closely with those security cameras placed inside, not outside the home. Why put security vision throughout the inside of the home, recording what goes on at the inside? Well, uh, the light in our pantry would be, uh, would be off at night, and then it was on in the morning. We couldn't figure out what was going on. So we're like, well, why don't we just put one of the cameras in there to see if one of the kids are sleepwalking? And that's why that camera was there. Did you know that there were cameras inside your house? I did not at that time, no. Looking back now, though, do you think that's a bit much, Dad? I don't think that it was much. He was using it to keep track on me and see if I was doing my chores in the house. It wasn't to watch your son? Mm -mm. Not to check on them for any other reason? No, to sleepwalk. It just kind of seems odd to me to have cameras set up inside a home that's watching all the time. It feels like it's a tad extreme, in my opinion. I think you're extremely misinformed, with all due respect. Again, police have a different theory. I think it was to watch Nathan for sure, but it wasn't to watch Nathan because he's sleepwalking. I think it was to, to watch him because they were afraid of him. John and Beth still suffer from daily pain, and Beth is blind in one eye. But every few months, they drive four hours from Moses Lake to Nathan's prison to visit their son. <laughs> look at that. Is it going for the, going for the Santa Claus look? There you go. <laughs> you feel pretty lucky to be alive? Uh-huh. Very. It has its glitches, but I still get to see my boy. I still get to see my husband and daughter. This is a... You say that in such a loving way, I still get to see my son, even after he tried to kill you. How are you so forgiving? I don't know if it's forgiveness, because if Nathan has something going on in the brain, he couldn't control it any better than I could. I guess I looked at it as, you don't forgive a child because they have cerebral palsy. Yeah. So why would I forgive my son for having a mental health condition? But with all respect, it's not the fact that your son has a mental health condition. It's the fact that your son put a gun to your head and tried to kill you. Yes. But he did that because of the condition. I looked at it as, I, I, I agree with everyone. His actions are, are, were wrong. They're not acceptable. Um, I had to sit there and, and you know, uh, with the attorney saying, yes, what he did was wrong. He should be punished for that. But I understand why. I don't think I'll ever be super used to, you know what I mean, like looking out and seeing a fence. But uh, it's something you kind of adapt to, so it's, it's not always on the mind. Nathan will be 29 when he's eventually released from prison. He'll have spent most of his life behind bars. He says he looks forward to working as a mechanic and reconnecting with his parents as a free man. Why do you think they were able to tell you that they still love you and that they were able to forgive you? 
For me, that is something that is quite extraordinary. I don't... That's something, and I ask my parents about this, and they say it's something that I'll never really understand until I have children, to know the unconditional love for a parent to a son or a daughter. Nathan has apologized, and even if the question of motive is unclear, the forgiveness part is not. Oh, I love you, buddy. What are your hopes for the future? Um, I hope to have family reunions. I, I, um, I think as right now today, our family loves each other immensely. I think there's a, a, a huge bond that's there. Um, I think we're all stronger than what we were when this started. Definitely. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.